Good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I'm, my name is Susan Goldberg. I'm the editor-in-chief of National Geographic magazine. And I'm very honored to be here today to moderate this panel with four of the uh, world's most preeminent experts on blindness. Uh, this panel is framed around the question of can we end or prevent blindness by 2020? And it's partially to raise awareness of this condition which afflicts 40 million people in the world, 90% uh, of whom live in the developing world. Uh, the, main, the main cause of, of global blindness is cataracts, which for those of us who you know, live in the, in, the, in the developed world seems so tragic and so difficult to hear because as we know, cataracts are such a, such a generally fixable condition. Uh, the other main causes of blindness are glaucoma, lack of eyeglasses or contacts, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, which is a growing problem. Uh, with, with the rise of diabetes and infectious, di and infectious diseases. So let's look at what's being done, what are the promising pathways, and is there a road that we're on in terms of reversing or even uh, ending blindness? So let me briefly introduce our, our panel here. Starting at my left, uh, Josh Sains is the director of the Center for Brain Science at Harvard, and he does basic research on the billions of neurons that connect with each other in the brain. His current focus is on the circuits in the retina that underlie visual perception and that fail in many cases of blindness. He says the retina is also a particularly good first target for other brain diseases. Well, why is that? Well, for one thing, it's the only part of the brain outside of your skull. So Josh has been watching one breakthrough treatment up close and personal, and that's for his mother. As he says, she's stubborn, and uh, she refused to see the doctor until the vision in one eye was nearly gone. Now for that eye, the mo molecular medicine for macular degeneration came too late. But the shots into her better eye, he says, were incredibly successful and it really works. So his advice, get in early. It's hard to get back the things that you lost. Next to him, Graziella Pellegrini. Uh, stem cell advances are revolutionizing the field of regenerative medicine, and that's a field in which Graciela is a distinguished pioneer. She is a professor of cell biology at the University of Modena. Um, one of her best known achievements may also be among her most satisfying. She and her collaborator were the first in the world to develop stem cell therapy to um, repair damaged corneas. Uh, they take the stem cells um, from around the iris and from around the undamaged part of the iris, put them back and then they regenerate corneal tissues. Now this treatment has had a 76% success rate on 150 patients, some of whom have been followed for more than a decade. And some of these people had been blind for 20 years. So her team is gonna submit data to the FDA this year and launch clinical trials in Europe. And as she says, you can't imagine the emotion when people can see again. Next to her, Al Summer. Al had planned to be a professor specializing in internal medicine along with many, many thousands of other students. And then he told me one day he fell asleep in the library and when he woke up, he saw a book on the state of academic ophthalmology and noticed there were just 12 people in the United States entering this field. Maybe I could make a bigger difference, he thought. <laughs> so he was right. And thanks to that well-timed nap and fortuitously placed book, one of the world's great experts on public health and blindness found his calling. It's estimated that between half a million and a million children every year do not die or go blind because of breakthroughs made by Al at the CDC and in his work in Indonesia and London. He has won every award imaginable in the last 40 years, and he's now Dean Emeritus at the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. And last but certainly not least, David Cox. David is a neuroscientist and computer scientist at Harvard who's studying the brain and trying to replicate vision in machines. So very cutting edge work. So the way he sees it, the eye's retina is the camera, the brain is the computer that understands the camera's image. But instead of just trying to fix the camera when it's broken, he wants to fix the computer by understanding the software of the brain. Now that kind of understanding would not just help cure and prevent blindness, but would also have some significant implications for other brain afflictions, afflictions such as schizophrenia and autism. Um, and he says, we don't know the language the brain speaks, 
but it's when and not if we learn that language. This is an alternate future approach to fixing the retina. So thank you all for being here today. Like I said, I'm honored to be in your presence. Let me start um, with a very kind of 30,000 foot question. And Al, why don't I start with you? So preventing blindness or restoring vision, where are we making more progress and why? Well, I, I think we're making progress in both areas. Uh, the restoring vision is in its early stages. So it's people like uh, uh, my colleagues here who are working in the laboratory uh, trying to understand some of these basic issues. Uh, my work is primarily uh, at this stage working with people and looking at the issues of why we can't prevent those things that we already know how to prevent. So you already mentioned, you know, cataract, half of all blindness in the world is cataract. We know how to take out cataracts. We can restore perfect vision uh, in that 50% of the people who are blind from cataract. The problem is most of those people live in poor countries with very few facilities, very few trained ophthalmic surgeons, very little money to support doing what is no more than a $100, 15-minute operation. How do we do that? Uh, two or three of the major causes of blindness that we can now prevent and do largely prevent are the xerophthalmia that you mentioned, the work that I did, trachoma and onchocerciasis, and that's why 90% of all the blindness is in the developing world, because they are not receiving the preventive services that we know how to uh, provide, but simply don't have the resources and the trained uh, person power to do that. And there is a, a large international effort represented with almost every country in the world called Vision 2020. And that goal is to use the techniques we already know, apply them and prevent people from going blind from things they need not go blind from, and perhaps find those early diagnostic techniques for things like glaucoma uh, that we could prevent the blindness in the first place, whereas uh, the uh, real research challenge now is what do you do with people once they're down the track of things that we can't reverse and don't know how to fix. Well, and so, Graziella, that brings us to you. How It's such an incredible thing that you've been able to restore the vision of some, you know, a small number, but a very breakthrough um, research of a small number of people who've had uh, these issues with the cornea. Can you tell us a little more about that? Well, yes. We, we start many, many years ago uh, working in general on uh, stratified epithelia, which are the, uh, I mean, the cells covering the body and defining what is, what belong to us and what is external to us. And uh, we found a way to identify in some part of the human eye a specific area where are localized stem cells of the cornea. And the cornea, for those of us who are not deep in the field, is the transparent membrane, which is in front of the color part of the eye. It is transparent and is needed for the vision, so it is important to maintain as such. And it is uh, one part of the, of the body which is avascular, totally avascular, without vessels. In several patients, as coming from different kind of uh, pathology with different problems like post-infective damage, which is quite frequent, uh, in, uh, especially in very hot countries, or in case of contact lens abuse, which is frequent in other parts of the world, or chemical burns, which are not so unusual in, in several jobs, uh, destroy the corneal surface and the stem cell. So the cornea cannot be renewed over time and it can, cannot be maintained as a transparent membrane. So those people lose the vision because the cornea become completely <coughs> opaque and vascularize because the wound is closed by the white part of the eye, which is completely different. So analyzing the ocular surface in several parts of the eye, we found a specific area where are contained the stem cell, powerful cells, able to regenerate this transparent membrane of the humans uh, all over their life. So we develop a technology uh, and being able to isolate from a very small biopsy, one millimeter is like uh, a mosquito in the eye, very small uh, area from the same patient having the lesion. And we isolate the stem cell from this small biopsy we grow them in culture under specific condition or specific carrier, and we reconstruct the tissue of the same patient for transplantation.
That's just... That, this that. Uh, then was extensively tested at uh, clinical level on uh, several patients because it's not so a frequent pathology. But what I, I think is important if, is to have understood, uh, I mean, the mechanism, the kind of problems uh, to define all the variables. And we have extensively done even because we underwent the regulatory path from this point of view. And uh, I mean, this opened the possibility to other treatment. Once you have understood how it works, I mean, similar, cri similar criteria can be applied to other field, to other kind of uh, pathology with other and I will, I will ask you different more. Different condition. Yeah. Thank you. And I will ask you more about that other treatment in a minute. But Josh, tell us you know, the breakthroughs that are being made in your work. Well, my own work is very basic. It's about how the retina works. Um, and I'll say a little bit about that and then about breakthroughs that are more clinically relevant. Um, the, the retina, as you yourself said, is the most accessible part of the brain. It's outside the skull. It's the only part that comes with its own lens. So you can look into it in live experimental animals and even live people. Um, and methods are improving to look at its individual neurons uh, in life and um, follow what happens to them in disease states. Um, my own work, quickly, is on the neural circuits in the retina. I think it's going to be the first part of the brain that will be cracked, that will really understand in a satisfying way. And although David says it's a camera, it's, a, it's, it's actually a camera plus Photoshop. It does a lot of computation and processing on its own that it then feeds to the brain. And these circuits are, um, you know, five years ago, I would say they were as mysterious as the circuits of the rest of the brain. But technology has moved so fast that we can, I, I think, look forward to understanding how the retina works as a neuronal machine uh, in five years, meaning we'll know what all the cell types are, we'll know how they're connected, we'll know what their functions are, and we'll know what messages they send to the brain. Um, now, in terms of how is this going to help uh, cure or prevent blindness, um, I think it's going to work in conjunction with progress being made in the rest of the brain. The main retinal diseases, so-called back-of-the-eye diseases, are neurodegenerative diseases. So they're diseases not of miswiring, but diseases where neurons get sick and die. And that's what happens in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease. And I think as we move on, the progress in neurology and the progress in ophthalmology are going to feed each other because they're going to be very, very similar mechanisms. They're going to be similar disease targets. And so that's um, where my hope uh, lies, um, plus the fact that as new modalities uh, come online, gene therapy, for example, uh, optogenetics, stem cells, uh, things we can talk about as we go on, my guess is a lot of them will be tested first in the retina. Retinal diseases, because we know so much about them and we know how to get into them, may be the test bed for a lot of therapies um, which eventually will be used in the rest of the brain. Well, now, David, this brings us to you. You, you know, the description of what you're doing is, um, it sounds so science fiction in a way, you know, but you're developing mechanisms for machines to be able to see. I know that the brain can now control um, artificial limbs. Can we ever get the brain to control an artificial eye? Sure, yeah, and uh, I mean, if you look at vision uh, as an engineer would, it's a cascade of, of modules and operations. So the light has to get through the optics of the eye, and if those are damaged, uh, you lose sight. If the retina, the, a very sophisticated camera, sorry, Josh, um, if that's damaged, uh, then the, the signal doesn't propagate further. But ultimately, where it's going is to the brain. Uh, and there are a couple relay stations along the way in the brain that are ultimately responsible for experiencing and, and understanding what we see. And the more we're able to understand how those circuits work, the more we can, uh, sort of, we can either interface with those. So you could imagine um, artificial eyes, bionic eyes, and already you could interface those with the retina. Or you can increasingly start to think about interfacing directly with the brain, as long as we understand the language of the brain, as long as we have the technology to do that interfacing. Uh, and currently, uh, a lot of the technologies we have aren't uh, aren't ideal for interfacing with the neuronal tissue. Uh, so what we end up having to do with current bionic eyes is to actually have quite a bit of computer processing to s help you see and sort of meet the brain halfway. So there's quite a bit of video processing that goes into, uh, into that, that 
artificial camera, the artificial eye, that then can interface with the brain uh, to actually give you either the understanding or even a little bit of the experience of seeing. Well, let me ask all of you. I mean, it sounds like we're probably a ways away from having a true bionic eye. Um, but what do we think are going to be the breakthroughs that will, you know, be the most prevalent in the next few years? Things that might be available to consumers um, that would really allow people to see again who can't see or that would stop a disease in its tracks, kind of like what you said your mother was going through with immacular degeneration. Um, well, there are many things in clinical trials. Um, what are the most one exciting the ones? So, ones yeah. One that I think is exciting, if you'll bear with me, is what my mom has called wet macular degeneration. And um, that is treated, not perfectly, but remarkably well. And that itself is a breakthrough of recombinant DNA. That is a new, sort of a new kind of medication. Um, more people have uh, something called dry macular degeneration. And for that, there is no treatment. Um, and most dry macular degeneration proceeds to wet macular degeneration, so if you could cure that, you'd, you'd have th the whole thing. Um, there's great science recently suggesting that dry macular degeneration is a disease of what's called the complement system, a, the body's, a part of the body's sort of innate immune system that fights off dangers of all sorts. Um, and there's now a couple clinical trials taking advantage of that knowledge, and I emphasize we don't even know if the fundamental insight is right, but there's good enough evidence to go in with other sort of molecular medicines, recombinant DNA uh, uh, products, to try to um, zap the complement system before it leads to dry macular degeneration and then blindness. Um, so those trials are I think they're just coming out of phase two. They're starting phase three, which means it'll be quite a while till we know. Um, but A, I think that's very exciting. B, it also illustrates the point I made that the retina may be the place to test out um, methods to treat other brain diseases. So there's a lot of evidence now that Alzheimer's may uh, involve defects in the complement system. So on top of the excitement of being able to fix dry macular degeneration, if that works out, that could lead to insights that be directly applicable to Alzheimer's. That's, that would be very exciting indeed. Gra Graciela, so your, uh, the, st the stem cell therapy that, that you've been working on, this is going to go to the FDA, you're going to submit some papers to the FDA. What can we expect to see happens next? Well, uh, I cannot say exactly the timing about uh, possibly a possible submission to FDA. Uh, now we just obtained the approval from uh, European Medicinal Agency, and we are supposed I mean, to, to start treating uh, European patients to a multi-country clinical trial and uh, start I mean, distributing this kind of product. At the meantime, we will, of course, evaluate uh, uh, and we'll have some advice uh, at FDA because uh, there are big differences in the regulatory system between different continents. We have yes. seen that, I mean, we have, uh, apparently everybody is uh, concerned about the safety, but the vision of safety is deeply different between different, uh, in different continents. And uh, everybody has his own criteria and we have to face uh, what is the, I mean, the vision of FDA. Now uh, we consider at European level mainly uh, start distributing. Since in the past uh, we were producing this kind of therapy in Italy and the patients were forced to travel to Italy to have the treatment. And this is a strange condition and it's not the best for the patient, especially a blind patient should have the therapy available to him in his country. Not and so when will people in Europe be able to begin to get that kind of therapy? At uh, the end of this year, we'll uh, officially start the clinical trial, and, uh, but we are starting distribution already in those months uh, to the center that should be qualified, should be certified under the GMP rules. So there is all the, the, all the rules, all the process of certification which is requested for this kind of therapy. So the treatment will become available soon. Are we talking about this being able to uh, 
be tested on hundreds of people or thousands of people or? I mean, uh, we don't have to test now because uh, we had the acknowledgement of our previous trial uh, that were controlled uh, in a retrospective uh, evaluation by inspectors from European medicinal agencies. So our previous data were acknowledged and considered full compliant. Uh, we have to increase, I mean, the, the trial in terms of evaluating, for example, different medical background uh, all around Europe. How can this different medical background can affect the clinical results of, uh, of the treatment? And this was requested by European Medicinal Agency. And, and then, uh, I mean, once we have the, um, let's say, qualification of the medical doctor for this kind of treatment, we, we can uh, proceed and treat the patient finally in their respective countries. Since it is very easy to, to have a small piece of tissue, which is, you can imagine, is smaller than the eye, traveling all around Europe, and is easier and less expensive than even the patient traveling. <coughs> yes, so <laughs> we are going to do. Of course, we want to ask also the FDA advice, uh, since other people, even in the US, was interested in developing this, uh, this kind of treatment with stem cell. I think, uh, uh, in addition to the importance that we can give to the specific treatment and the specific blindness, uh, which for me was, I mean, the real motivation for many, many years of my life, because uh, looking something that apparently is unaffordable, I mean, somebody who was blind for 20 years and you can find the solution to the problem is, is something strongly motivating you. It's when you see the smile on the face of that person that recover, I mean, the full function is, is uh, something that, that changes your life. I would imagine that would be It's really, really impressive. Yeah. But still, we have to consider uh, many other, many other approach many other things that can, in, can be improved and I mean with a similar, uh, I mean the, the point is that the first stem cell product uh, was approved. This is important because there were many concerns toward the stem cell since the stem cells are considered something that remain in a body for all the life of the, per, uh, the people. So the regulatory authorities were concerned about something remaining forever in the body and once they accept the idea that this can be done and it is a safe procedure because we had a follow-up up to 14 years after transplant, this opened the possibility to all the other specialists, all the other cell biologists or gene therapists uh, to proceed on this way. That is and especially with the iPS cells which, which are adult reprogrammed cells, so for those of you who are not deep in the field are adult cells that become again embryonic. And this means that we can build tissues with our own cells, sorry, our own cells, so not giving immunologic rejection. So it is important field. And the idea that stem cell can be used open even new possibility in this field, especially in Japan where they are very active on this, on this path. Let me stop you there. Let Al, you know, if I were sitting in your shoes, I would feel somewhat frustrated by this conversation because here's all this amazing stuff that can go on, but in the third world we can't even seem to get, you know, people eyeglasses or get them cataract operations. How do we attack this sort of basic problem? Yeah. Well, let me bring it to the first world, okay. actually. So I'm an ophthalmologist. I'm actually the only ophthalmologist amongst this group of very smart people, self-excluded. Um, so let me tell you about two practical diseases that we've not talked about uh, and give you an example of that. So one is diabetic retinopathy. Right. So we're going to wait for our colleagues uh, here on this panel to figure out how we prevent diabetic retinopathy in the first place. And diabetic retinopathy is basically the uh, growth of abnormal, leaky, hemorrhaging vessels in people with diabetes. And as you've already mentioned, diabetes is an endemic, uh, an epidemic growing around the world as people become more obese. Uh, they're becoming more sensitive to diabetes, more diabetes, more diabetic retinopathy. Now the key to preserving vision in diabetic retinopathy is early treatment, primarily uh, laser therapy, but also a very simple approach to what Josh's uh, mother is going with uh, intravitreal injections. So you have to know when someone is developing diabetic retinopathy. Now you think that was fairly straightforward. Everybody more or less knows when they're a diabetic. 
at least whether a diabetic severe enough to develop diabetic retinopathy. And we recommend to everybody, certainly in the developed world, that they get an annual dilated eye examination so that we can pick up the earliest manifestations of retinopathy and so we can treat it usually with laser therapy. Problem is we, there are not enough ophthalmologists in the developed world to in fact examine everybody who has, and people don't go for those examinations. Our uh, existing recommendation is that every diabetic should have an annual dilated eye examination. So as an experiment, we went to the best managed care organizations, you know, where people really are doing the right thing and giving the right advice and looked at how frequently, we gave them an extra leeway. We said, well, how, what proportion of people with diabetes who should get an annual eye examination even get one once every two years? Once every two years. We're so giving them more, you know. Was it half? It was, well, yeah, very close, 40%, mm -hmm. 40%. So until we can get people to get, now how can they do that? We have to stop thinking the way we've always thought. So everybody who has diabetes that's going to put them at risk of retinopathy gets a medication, whether it's insulin if they have insulin-dependent diabetes or they get an oral drug if they don't have that severe. That means they have to go to a pharmacist, right? So why don't we put a camera in every pharmacist's office that when that pharmacist gives somebody their medication at least once a year, takes a photo of the back of the eye. We have cameras, you don't have to dilate the eye, you can get a full picture of the back of the eye. That gets sent digitally to a reading center, although a computer will do most of the reading these days, and it'll say, this person needs treatment. Well, so what is preventing something Inertia. like this? Inertia. Inertia, okay. politics, you know, each uh, profession's own interest in what they do. I mean, I've been on this theme for 20 years now, having uh, been chair of the National Eye Institute's Eye Health Education Program, and, and that seemed to me a reasonable thing to, could not get the organizations together to do that. So that's, that's one side, and it's the side of how do we do what we know how to do. The other side, just to bring in a disease that we've not talked about, is open angle glaucoma. Very major cause of blindness around the world. Uh, and actually, while everybody's at risk of it, African Americans or Africans are particularly uh, high risk of it. Um, and our approach to glaucoma has been the same for the last 100 years, and that's reduce intraocular pressure. And there's no question that if you reduce the intraocular pressure enough, in people who have very high intraocular pressure, that you will at least slow the progression, if not prevent them from going blind entirely. Problem is, is that we have since then discovered, some of it was my own work, that in fact, most people who have open angle glaucoma and are going to get blind do not have very high pressures. And is just a, a dead end trying to reduce intraocular pressure because you can't reduce it very much without putting the eye in danger of other diseases. So now there's a whole movement to using a totally different approach to the one that we presently use. That's in, in clinical trials and in laboratory research, and that's using chemoprotection. Some way to protect the ganglion cells that make up the optic nerve, which are part of the brain that both David and uh, Josh will tell you. Uh, so we have to take yet another totally different approach to a very important cause of blindness in the world. So is that, is glaucoma really one of the most stubbornly mysterious diseases? In it's stubbornly in part because we went down one track mm -hmm. and we never considered other tracks and it took some just very straightforward epidemiology to say, well, it's true. People with the highest intraocular pressures are at the highest risk of going blind, but most people don't have very high pressures and in fact, therefore, even though their individual risk of going blind is lower than that of those who have very high pressures. They make up such a large proportion of the population that the vast majority of people who go blind from glaucoma, in fact, do it with relatively low pressures. And so we need a different approach. Let me ask one more question and then we'll open it uh, to the audience. And I'd also like to introduce somebody in the audience. But if ending blindness in 2020 is probably not going to happen entirely, uh, given that's only five years away, what is the right year? What is the year that we can say we're going to really be able to 
help a lot more people than we're helping now. And I guess I would just ask each of you, David, why don't we start with you? Uh, so I, my suspicion is that it's not going to have a single answer, okay. and, and partly because it's hard to define what ending blindness or restoring vision means. Well, how you would define it then. Well, so, so to give you an example, there is a commercially available bionic eye. Right. Uh, so there's an epiretinal implant uh, it's, uh, with a camera that, that feeds into a, a processor, which then goes to the retina, 60 electrodes. So what this can basically do is can create 60 points of light um, that you can see. Um, the, the, the healthy uh, human eye has one and a half million retinal ganglion cells. So you don't see a lot. You don't see a lot. Um, and it's hard to even say, um, to you, it's hard to even put that into terms of 20 whatever. I mean, sometimes people say 21,000, but it's a different kind of seeing. Okay. And you can learn how to use it. Uh, to do things, and that's great, and that makes a big difference in people's quality of life, um, but it's not quite the same thing as, as restoring their vision. And uh, there's currently a version that's got 200 electrodes that's, uh, under, that's being tested. There's another effort to, to pipe directly into the back of the brain, which is a much larger area, so you can get many more electrodes. So um, it's going to be a gradual process where a lot of people are helped, but I think it's going to be very hard to say this is okay. the point at which we're really, you know, we've ended blindness. It's going to be a gradual, slow a process. Gradual, slow. Josh, what do you think about that? Well, I, what, is, what is the timeline? So I think we're going to have the basic knowledge that will help us with things like glaucoma and macular degeneration and retinitis pigmentosa that we didn't talk about um, in 10 to 15 years. Good. About 2020. Thank you. Graziella? Well, from my point of view, uh, I mean, ending blindness within 2020 is <laughs> unaffordable, but I would be very happy to have, a, if we have a clear idea of uh, the number of hurdles that stop us from uh, giving the solution. I mean, there are several kind of, uh, several parts of science which are working in different fields with different approaches, as we have shown uh, in this discussion and many other that can provide a solution, can provide improvement. And sometimes we are slow in producing the solution, not only for technical problem, but because there are many other things that are not properly working. I mean, this kind of uh, complex task to reach need multidisciplinary teams. So many people uh, working together, having completely different location, different background, and those people have to work together and to share results and the interest of their institution. It means that, I mean, for example, having first the education of working in a um, multidisciplinary team is absolutely needed now to have to reach any difficult task. Second uh, is uh, uh, having law that allow to share, let's say, patent, uh, uh, to have uh, uh, proper collaboration, or uh, let's say having a private public partnership that allow uh, a better development, more funding and more uh, advancement in the field. And then proper regulation. Sometimes, I mean, the regulation is absolutely needed because humans cannot become like uh, guinea pigs for experiments. But uh, uh, I mean, science is evolving very fastly, and we need experts in the regulatory panels which are evoluted with the same speed. Otherwise, they become a stop instead of being an uh, added value for this technology. If we have a list of our problem, of our hurdles within 2020, we know which problem we have to solve in order to speed up the solution okay. of the problem. So creating, creating the framework by yeah. 2020, that gets yeah. us part way there. All right, in the, in the developing world, just to go back to okay. that for a minute, are we looking at anything near term for really cracking that barrier on fixing cataracts, on fi figuring out just some way to attack that? Yeah, I, I think it's important to put in perspective, it's a journey. So in the last 10 years, uh, we have stopped people from going blind from vitamin A deficiency, river blindness, and trachoma. So that's a couple million people a year who are no longer going blind. So there's a big impact. When are we going to get around to grappling with cataract? That's a social process, but progress is being made. Lots of us have, have uh, programs out there trying to see how you organize society to do that. And I would think by 2020, we'll have made a significant impact on that, just as in the last 10 years, we've made a very significant impact on the other blinding diseases in the developing world. 
Well, thank you all. I do want to open this to questions, but first let me introduce somebody in the audience. We have uh, Mr. Sandy Greenberg. Mr. Greenberg has created a $2 million prize for whomever can come the closest uh, to a means of helping restore uh, site by 2020. And I was going to ask him if he could maybe just take a, f a few minutes to explain uh, his, his effort to us. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I, too, am honored to be here. Uh, I, I hate to start off the, these comments by disagreeing with you, uh, because the prize that my wife, Sue, and I have created is now $3 million oh, pardon me. in gold <laughs> bullion. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's not the worst mistake I've ever made, let me say. <laughs> For sure it not. It must be perhaps. tied to the Swiss franc. <laughs> 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 it may become clear that I may be the worst mistake you ever made. But, but uh, thank you for the opportunity. Sue and I have, in fact, uh, on October 18th, 2012, created a prize, as I said, of $3 million in gold to the person or persons who does most or contributes most to ending blindness by 2020. Uh, to be precise, by December 13th, 2020, which is 2,978 days after we began in 2012, the same amount of time it took the United States to reach the moon after President mm. Kennedy announced it. So my reasoning, which may be flawed, is that if we can go to the moon as a civilization, then surely we could end this affliction, which has been with uh, all of us and our bipedal ancestors for more than six million years. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, speak to the efforts my wife has made to uh, tolerate me for the past half century uh, and to be with me along all of, uh, all of these steps. And finally, to say that these conversations began with Professor Schwab in 2008, and that's how we got here. And I have to thank, in particular, Al Somer, Josh Sains, and our friend Stu Eisenstadt for helping us get here. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> that, that is really inspirational. I think we've heard a lot here that is, is quite inspirational as well. Let me open it to the audience for questions. I would just ask that you identify yourself, please. Jeff Richards, AO Research Institute, Davos. Uh, a question maybe to uh, Professor Pellegrini. At the moment, you're culturing your cells in the laboratory for these operations, I guess? Yes. When do you see that you'll be able to do this intraoperative? Because as soon as you can take stem cells intraoperatively and put them back, it's mm -hmm. much easier on the regulatory conditions, it's much cheaper, and then yeah. you can come to well, more of the world. Well, uh, if I have to see an evolution of the technology, well, it's not possible to do uh, intraoperatively for a simple reason, because uh, we need the time to amplify the culture. I mean, we need the time to grow the cells. So uh, the cells have their cell cycle, they have their time, and we have to wait for the time of the cells. What can be done that I see as the future of this technology is uh, to have uh, some seal system, because there are some models that can be probably applied to this kind of technology, uh, so, I mean, all processing can be done almost everywhere. We d you don't need a specific facility with a very high level of installation, but you can have a seal system or bioprocessor that can provide uh, the final results without too much manipulation, too much cost, or too much installation. Still, the time is needed because you need to give to the cells the time to proliferate, to differentiate, to do properly their job. May if I you- I want to interrupt, because that's one concept is to expand the cells. Another concept would be instead of putting a large number of stem cells in, would be to put a few stem cells in. So if you think of an orchestra and a conductor, you put the few stem cells in as the conductor, which tell the other cells what to do. 
which is, I know only a few percent in stem cell work look in this way, but this could be possibly done interoperatively I by mean, only putting a few cells back in and they then lead the other cells. Yeah, 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 of course. And this approach was used, for example, in India, uh, where they take a biopsy which is a little bit bigger and they uh, cut in very small piece and they put the piece all around the eye. Uh, I mean, if you are in the countryside in India, that's the best thing you can do because it's uh, is impossible to have the installation for culturing cells making a tissue. However, you have to consider that since the cells, even in vivo, need time, you will have the ocular surface not covered by an epithelium, which is absolutely needed for your safety, for maintenance for having a stable corneal surface, which is degraded in absence of epithelium, all the time that the cells need to proliferate. Uh, with our approach, uh, we uh, grow the cells out of the body, and the eye is covered by the scar. So is not attacked by microbia, uh, molds, or whatever. And then when the epithelium is ready, you go to remove the scar and you cover the eye with another barrier, new barrier that can protect the eye from any kind of possible adverse event. So it's more safe for patient. Other questions from the group? Yes. Yeah, uh, David say, uh, said the uh, current uh, uh, approach for using the uh, processor to uh, camera to do can do like uh, 60 uh, about 64 I think the uh, resolution but the limitation mainly it's not because the semiconductor camera it's mainly because of the connection or the uh, process inside so are we seeing any major uh, progress regarding how to find out how to send the signal in because uh, in fact today even with smart Phone. We have much better camera than what is uh, available uh, now uh, with the eyes. And tell us who you are. Uh, yeah, Wen Chi Chen from uh, VIA and the HTC. Okay, well, let's be clear. The, the cameras can be brilliantly high resolution. The processors can process huge amounts of data. It just, just matters how big the, the computer you're carrying around with you to do the video processing is. The limitations currently are on the electrodes. So actually, the thing that gets implanted into the brain, how many electrodes are there available? and what these electrodes end up doing is they produce these things called phosphenes, and, and so basically a little flash of light. And actually one of the biggest limitations is, is not even just the density of those electrodes, but the fundamental technology of stimulation. So uh, as Josh mentioned, the retina is a very sophisticated camera. It just doesn't just tell you the light level. It, uh, some cells will tell you that there's a light spot on a dark background, and some cells will tell you that there's a dark spot on a light background. When you stimulate, they're right next to each other. When you stimulate with an electrode, you're hitting both those channels at the same time. There's many channels in the retina. Uh, this is also true in, in, in the brain. There's cells right next to each other that tell you that you're seeing a, a little bit of orientation like this, and the cell right next to it that's telling you you see a little edge that's like that. When you stimulate with these sort of coarse tools of these stimulating electrodes, you hit them all at the same time. So it, it's fundamentally not working the same way that our brain works. And that's really the biggest limitation. Uh, we can put more channels in, and actually, if you want to look uh, to technology for doing that, look to the, the, uh, the Brain Initiative, for instance, where there's a huge investment in new technologies. And if you look in research labs, the kinds of electrode arrays we're able to put in have much higher density uh, than what's being able to be applied in the clinic. But even there, uh, I think we need to move past even just stimulating electrodes, because uh, that's one of the fundamental limitations. This isn't so different than cochlear implants. Uh, so cochlear implants have been around for quite some time. There's hundreds of thousands of people who have them, fundamentally the same technology. Those don't restore hearing, per se. They give you a new way to hear, and you have to learn how to do that. And, and vision uh, uh, prosthetics are, are progressing much the same way. They give you something that's a little bit different than, than what they're replacing, and you can learn to use that. But there are technologies potentially on the horizon for much more targeted stimulation where we can stimulate only one type of cell and maybe we could start to think uh, decades out about actually restoring a much more nuanced, much more uh, equivalent uh, form of vision. That's fascinating. Yes, ma'am. I'm Nicola von Nutrati from Zurich. I'm a medical journalist. Uh, something that interests me, maybe one of you knows about that, is there any new treatment against short-sightedness? Because in some Asian countries, 
short-sightedness is something that is really extremely frequent. <coughs> and I think the malignant, uh, the malignant form is, uh, is very bad and can lead to blindness. So maybe any of you know something about that? Well, Al, I mean, you've talked about this yeah. as being a big so, issue. So nearsightedness, yeah. um, uh, essentially what happens is the eye becomes longer than it should. And that's what leads to degeneration in the retina and really very serious problems, other than just wearing glasses like I've done since the fourth grade. Um, uh, there are, we don't know a lot about what causes it. There are lots of animal models, which we've learned a great deal about. Um, there's some epidemiologic data and some trials that have suggested if we took young children and essentially prevented them from focusing. So, you know, your eye is really quite a wonderful tool. You can look at distance and everything is in focus. And then you read up close or knit or, or, and, and you can see that. Now, when you get to my age, you can't do that anymore. You've got to wear, how many people wear reading glasses? You Everybody. have to wear reading glasses. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but as you get, um, it is thought that this, uh, what's called accommodation, this focusing up close, may be one of the things that in fact drives the eye to get too long for itself. And so some people have demonstrated that if you essentially use a, a drug, atropine or something like that, that prevents you from accommodating reading up close, that that may in fact slow the progression of nearsightedness. Also there's some epidemiologic evidence that when people get more exposure to sunlight and are outdoors that they in fact slow the progression. I've always gone with the thesis that uh, those of us who are nearsighted couldn't see out of doors. And so we didn't, you know, so I don't really know if it's cause and effect, but there's, a, there, there's some suggestions that's cause and effect. The problem is, is that people really want to have young children not being able to focus up close and having to wear glasses in order to be able to read and play with their toys and, and learn their colors and so forth and so on. So there's no, no absolutely agreed upon, certainly no, no practical way to prevent it at present, but there are things that one can do. If one, well, I was once going to do an experiment, and I actually convinced the commandant of the Naval Academy to prove that this preventing people from accommodating would in fact prevent them from developing nearsightedness. And what you need to know is uh, to enter the Naval Academy at the United States, probably true at every country, you have to have perfect vision without glasses, right? By the time they graduate four years later, 25% of them have become nearsighted. So they can't be line officers. They can work wonderfully on submarines because that's pretty close, but they can't be line officers. Um, and I actually convinced the commandant to let us atropinize, that is prevent the accommodation for half the incoming class. We had to get over who's gonna catch the football when Army plays Navy and that kind of thing. Um, but then they switched commandants on me. And as we were just about to launch that project, he said, no, no, we're not interested in that. We want to win those Navy uh, Army football games, and so we're not going to do that. Uh, so it's a work in progress. There's certainly nothing that's very practical that we can do at this point in time. I can't see behind me. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is for Dr. Sommer. And you're Nora. Uh, sorry, I'm Nora Volkov. I'm National Institutes of Drug Abuse at the NIH. And my question, I was taken by your statement that says we're making extraordinary advances in terms of new solutions that are going to be transformative, yet we already know how to prevent some of the disorders that lead to blindness, and you are some of the ones that are increasing, like diabetes retinopathy. But so, so if we already know, we know the path, what are the roadblocks that are not enable us to implement those? Because otherwise, if we can generate more knowledge, if we cannot solve the implementation, we're not going to solve the problem. What, what are your thoughts? So, so I would say there are two things. One is we can't stop looking for new innovations because not only are new innovations allow us to do things we couldn't do before, but they often come up with much simpler ways of doing things that are much more complicated to do now. I mean, it may be we could give somebody a drug and they will never get diabetes. I mean, that's, that's, so it's important to continue the innovation process, even if it's things that we already know how to do. The other part is organizing humans and their economic and political system to do the things that they need to do. So you know the United States well. We have the Affordable Care Act. It's less than perfect, but it's taken 60 years to provide some semblance of universal 
health insurance for Americans, where most European countries have had these for you know, half a century already. So like everything else, it's how do you organize people, the money, the political processes to put in shape things that are not rocket science, not what these people do, uh, that we know how to do, but you've got to put in the right economic stimuli and the right incentives to get people to actually do them. It's very frustrating. It's actually easier to do what they're doing. Do I see anybody behind me? No. You know, one of my big takeaways from this has been, and a number of you have mentioned it, this connection that I don't think most um, non-doctors really make between the health of the eye or understanding the eye and what's going on in the brain. And it seems like that is going to be one of the main things that we see uh, in, in the years to come. You know, the more we know about the eye, the more we're going to find out about the brain. One of the things I have uh, learned in all of this is um, ending blindness, uh, whether it's preventing it from happening or curing it after it does happen, is a really terrific story to do for National Geographic magazine, is, is what I've decided in, in talking to all of you over the last uh, few weeks. And so we, we will commence to do that. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. And I thank all of our wonderful panelists. Let's give them a round of applause.